All right, this is Dan Philippon, a professor and director of undergraduate studies of English, affiliated with the American Studies Department, writing studies, and we're lucky to have him affiliated with communication studies as well. Uh, his areas of expertise include environmental literature, which we're going to be talking about today, ideas of nature, culture, and place, rhetorical strategies and practical effects of literary texts and their creators, eco-criticism, but I noticed you wrote this in your bio, and I think it really is emblematic of, of the interesting aspects of your work, but also environmental history, environmental ethics, and conservation biology. And I highly recommend Dan's courses. And in fact, before we get started, Dan, do you have any... Um, uh, current courses or upcoming courses you'd like to mention to folks? Yeah, for sure. I regularly teach on the undergraduate level in the Department of English a course called Public Discourse, Coming to Terms with the Environment, which looks at a lot of things I think students in your course would find interesting. And then on the, on the graduate level, they change all the time depending on student interests, my interests, curricular needs. Um, but I usually teach uh, every few years a course either in eco-criticism of some kind or particularly 19th century environmental literature and culture. Uh, I happen to be teaching right now, uh, team teaching a course uh, called Transatlantic Environmental Humanities. So you can see there's a lot of overlap between those kinds of approaches, different um, subjects, but um, every two years for the graduate level and pretty much every year for undergrads. Great, well thank you. Um, our main topic today is I wanted to bring in Dan and discuss a book that, that it really has been influential to me, but to many people, and that is his book, Conserving Words, um, How American Nature Writers Shape the Environmental Movement. And as you'll see as we discuss this, there's several things that, that I think make this book stand out, and particularly in the con context of an environmental communication course, um, really need to be brought in. Um, the book had impact on several related fields, environmental studies, not just environmental literature, but um, beyond. Um, and I do highly recommend that students read it, uh, given the length of our texts and, and the, the kind of work you're doing in assignments. I didn't assign it this semester, but it's certainly something that I, I, I would like to in the future. Um, uh, the Journal of Interdis Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and the Environment had this to say about the book, and I think it's, for me, it really captures the, this. Philippon shows in meticulous fashion how his five Writer activists played integral, complex roles in the development of these important organizations and how often these people in their organizations interacted. Um, everybody that wrote about the book mentioned how well it's written and sort of praised it for um, bridging these various fields. Now to get started uh, with this conversation, I would say one rough restatement of the book before we lead into yeah. how you can represent your own work is I was fascinated by how writing in this case relates to behavior, policy, and ideology in what at one point on page four you call the ecology of influence. Mm -hmm. And you do so not by making leapfrog claims about effects, you know, here's the writing, yeah. it affects somebody Changes. else. Yeah but in detailed, well-drawn cases of these influential individuals themselves, how yeah. it influenced their own behavior and thinking, and then of course we know by virtue of who they were that they've been influential. Is that accurate, and how would you describe the book in this project? Yeah, no, that's, that's a um, great phrase to have pulled out of it. I'm glad you did. That, um, because the idea of an ecology of influence suggests how complicated this is, how multifaceted it is, and how interactive it is. Mm -hmm. So. You know, some days I wish I had just written a book about one writer, perhaps, because I, I had to layer five different writers, each of whom was involved in a particular, uh, the creation of a particular environmental organization. And also then on top of that, the way that I feel they did it uh, was through particular metaphors or ideas of nature. And so for each of those writers, organizations, and metaphors, there was this complex ecology of influence. And then there was the influence between and among all of them. So. It was, it's never uh, the case that uh, there would be a writer who would be directly influenced by one thing, who would write a book, that book would be read by a reader, that reader would go out and do something. Mm -hmm. It may be the case that there's multiple spheres of influence affecting the writer. Mm -hmm. The writer might affect many different people in different ways. The writer, him or herself, might, as we've seen in the book, be activists in some kind and make that change. Um, they're going to be influenced by different things. Um, so it's a constant process and interactive um, 
model for how to understand this idea of influence. And so, at least in literary studies, uh, studies of influence are are very tricky and very challenging because it's a very difficult thing to trace mm -hmm. directly. Um, but nevertheless, I feel like it is a very important idea to see the, that's all, of, that's what rhetoric and persuasion is all about, right? I want to influence you. I have an idea that I'm passionate about. I want you to do it. Yeah. Uh, and so trying to figure out what role do literary texts play in that, mm -hmm. I, I think is a worthy endeavor. Let's yeah, that absolutely. Way. And in fact, as I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but it just clicked in my mind. Um, an answer potentially to another question I had later on, a fairly idiosyncratic question. Abby is a contemporary of Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. And I found myself thinking, why not Rachel Carson? But looking at in the introduction where you have that wonderful matrix of mm -hmm. their connection like you just displayed between an, a metaphor, an idea, an organization they yeah. started, a movement, right. and maybe that's sort of one of the reasons why yeah. not to include a Carson because yeah. maybe she doesn't really, as you said, layered approach, doesn't right. really fit that. Yeah, and you know, for any book, you are you need to have some sort of uh, 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 organizational strategy. Mm -hmm. um, not, I suppose there are many books that don't have it, but I prefer the ones that do. <laughs> I think uh, I wrote one that didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> the the uh, notion being that, that for Carson in particular, although she was incredibly influential in the environmental movement, the thing that she did not do, she wasn't directly involved in the creation of environmental organization. Mm -hmm. Now that said, um, and this is something we uh, can talk some more about, is that Carson certainly was using metaphors in her work yeah. very, very powerfully um, driven by those metaphors and those metaphors in turn then had a powerful influence on her mm -hmm. readers on very specific kinds of public policy about mm -hmm. the environment um, and, and uh, uh, activists going forward. Yeah. So Carson wasn't omitted out of a, a lack of interest or a lack of metaphor, or but the fact rather that it's been done. And yeah, else, no, yeah, not at right, all. No. But rather, just simply out of uh, the fact that she was so busy as a, uh, a writer, as yeah. a field biologist, and uh, as a, a a person trying to make change in public policy, that she just wasn't involved with creating a particular organization yeah. to do so. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Thank you. That really makes sense. Um, I'm going to start out with a pretty general question here, the sort of biographical one for you. Yeah. You know, what led you to undertake the project? What conversations and questions were out there in the study of nature writing or nature writing itself that led you to undertake this historical and biographical case study approach? What what brought you into this? Yeah, you know, it's that's a great question because um, it's. Uh, um, I have always been drawn to the role of the individual in creating social change, and mm -hmm. that's probably not surprising. I'm an individual. We're all individuals. We all. <laughs> I'm have, not. Sorry, I'm thinking. Of, <laughs> I don't know if you know the Monty Python line. We're all individuals. I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's and now for something completely different. <laughs> right. I apologize. Uh, the so that has always been a, a pull for me to see mm -hmm. well what role do individuals play there's certainly plenty of studies if you come at this from a sociological perspective or an anthropological perspective we'll be interested in um, large-scale questions about culture for instance mm -hmm. or societies yes. and those great questions very valid questions but when it comes to writing unless you're writing a committee report not <laughs> and not the most compelling reading usually <laughs> that writing will be written by an individual. Yeah. And so those ideas, um, those bits of culture, those aspects of society will be filtered through an individual individual mm -hmm. writer. And um, most of the uh, very powerful writing comes from individuals. There are mm -hmm. cases certainly where collaboratively, mm -hmm. collectively authored documents have shaped the world in, in important ways. Mm -hmm. Declaration of Independence, good example. But even then, right, we have this sort of filtered through mm -hmm. an individual to start to draft this thing. Um, so that was one of the appeals. Um, and then as I read around and, and was um, studying the environmental movement, um, mm -hmm. and, and so I've always been interested in social movements, this connection became clear that no one had ever looked at before was what role have these individuals played in connection to larger organizations? And that too seems to me to be, you know, um, one of the most fascinating aspects of, of most of what we do in the academy is how for one reason or another, are individuals and and communities connected or disconnected? Mm -hmm. And this is one way uh, that I could explore that through things that really matter to me. Yeah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And and I, being an anthropologist myself, I do have that tendency to think mostly in the cultural, the collective, 
when in fact, when we, even when we do ethnographic work, it's usually these key informants, individuals right, that we sure. talk to. Yeah. And really in my own in environmental work, it's only recently I've started thinking about this idea of, of individual mediation. And that's one of the reasons I'm so glad to revisit your work. Um, looking at, for example, um, this will come up in a little bit, uh, individual activists, as it were, right. when there's less collective expression on the sort right. of metaphoric street yeah. and people are doing something individually on YouTube, yeah. not only can that matter, but how can it not matter? I mean, we're going to need it yeah. to matter in some way. And, and right. you, in some ways, take us to a point where we realize it's always mattered. Yeah. You and, know? and, you know, there's two pieces that are, are important to keep in mind uh, in terms of this uh, role of the individual. One is the... Um, uh, example of Bill McKibben, for instance, in 350.org. So mm -hmm. here's an organization. Everyone knows that this has been a very powerful organization to shift the debate about climate change. Mm -hmm. um, but it still has this very iconic person yeah. who has been um, as uh, well known for his writing mm -hmm. and his essays as he has been for his activism. And that tension between writing and activism is also a piece of the book and has yeah. been a longstanding interest of mine. Um, the second thing, though, that is important to remember is this isn't a kind of great man or great woman right. theory of history, right? That right. this idea that we will have the leader and that leader will embody our principles and, and drive change. Um, but rather it is a study, as you've pointed out, of the role that individuals play, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one individual among many individuals, and then that, that ecology, that ecological connection, mm -hmm. connectedness that in which those individuals are embedded. So it's not that one person is the most important, but rather this one person had a role to play mm -hmm. in that ecology. And they're all ciphers and models for all of us as individuals. Yeah, where you're absolutely. kind of thinking, absolutely. gee, I have those, those components, or I disagree with that, and right. think of it. Yeah, they're, right. they're kind of metaphors for all of us. Yeah. Which brings me to the next question. Your key concept here is metaphor, and you discuss metaphor as it relates to narrative, even in a dramaturgical kind of sense. You right. mentioned drama, which I was really fascinated by. And then also something that we will have discussed a lot in the class, that of framing. Right. Um, and so the metaphors attached to each one, the frontier, garden, park, wilderness, um, utopia. And then at the end, um, when we get to the end, I want to discuss this idea of the island metaphor, sure. how it intersects them all. Really fascinating. Um, so I guess ultimately the question here, when you chose that, when you chose to really foreground metaphor, um, why metaphor? Yeah, why metaphor? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's one of, if not the most powerful figures of speech that we have in the language. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to think of metaphor as many people do um, using a metaphor of a spotlight, yeah. um, that the spotlight shines attention on one particular aspect of an issue of our world um, and in doing so truly enlightens our understanding of that mm -hmm. but it also leaves a lot of things in the dark mm -hmm. uh, and so that spotlight can be incredibly powerful and incredibly bright um, and and so the way it shapes our understanding um, is crucial i think and so metaphor uh, in terms of the way i've used it in the book shows um, different aspects or spotlights different elements of a much larger um, contested concept of nature, this thing we mm -hmm. call nature, of which there are many definitions, as with many definitions of the environment, for instance, but um, uh, we might see nature as a park, we might see it as a wilderness, we might see it as a utopian space, a space of possibility, etc. cetera. Um, and all of those metaphors are true in one way, Mm -hmm. um, but they also hide other aspects mm -hmm. of what this thing is we call nature. Um, and in some ways it really is connected to um, the same approach that a lot of theologians take to the idea of God. Both the idea of God and the idea of nature are these grand mm -hmm. notions which have these very metaphorical aspects. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way a theologian might look at all the different lenses through which we could understand the idea of God, I look at all the different lenses we can understand this grand idea of nature. Yeah, and once again, I see a parallel to anthropology, the idea of myth, not yeah. in, in a pejorative, but a right. myth oh, is absolutely. something that has certain truths, but not right. necessarily, and then includes others. Yeah. Fascinating, in fact, leads perfectly into the next question um, uh, in relation to the question of eco-criticism. Right. And one of the things that fascinates me so much about the book, um, and you really bring it out in the introduction, 
is, is and I want to want to get this right, I don't want to misrepresent what you're saying even in asking the question, sure. but for example, you this, this island concept is both limiting and disciplining, mm -hmm. but also with positive valences, so you're not going to just toss it out. You know, right, um, right. and I think to contrast it, this is the yeah. only time I'm, I'm sort of putting you in contest with somebody. Oh, no, that's fine. And in yeah. fact, I like this book. I yeah. don't know if you know Morton's. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the name of the book is Ecology Without Nature, Rethinking Environmental Aesthetics. And it's a brilliant book as far as dissecting, looking at the question yeah. of, of nature. But ultimately, the conclusion is toss out toss nature, out. Yep. which leads me always to two things. Um, good luck with that. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, once you become the, the language czar, one can do that. Yeah. But also, you know, as opposed to the orientation you're taking to all of these terms, mm -hmm. it's sort of an either or approach as opposed to looking at the, the, the various uh, yeah. wrinkles and conundrums, et cetera. Um, on page seven, there's a nice quote in re that, that really led me to this. And once again, I don't want to misrepresent your book. And, and in a bit, I'm going to actually ask you to read a couple paragraphs. Yeah, sure. But in addition, because the meaning of these metaphors is flexible, mm -hmm. none is intrinsically linked to any particular ethical framework. Each could conceivably be used in the service of a variety of worldviews. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. We so yeah. often hear, say, in a graduate seminar, somebody will say that whole thing as if you've got these, you know, <laughs> intrinsic connections that you can, as it were, throw out the baby with a bathwater. Right. And I want to set up a question for you out of all of this that premise might not be accurate. So okay. I want, want you to be, be will, perfectly willing to challenge the premise. It really appears to me that you're avoiding, perhaps even critiquing, the common extremes mm -hmm. and reductionism of both eco-criticisms and s certain types of science, which you put in the terms of social construction and realism, mm -hmm. which I realize is more internal to the nature writing, not necessarily you know, um, uh, covalent with those two terms. And I would argue that the eco-critical extreme, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's fair to say that that idea that, that um, well, to a certain extent, even looking across those borders, an eco-critic might look at scientists and say, they're not aware of their own discourse, language, et cetera, and I'm going to inform yeah. them. You know, you get right. sometimes that kind yeah. of not, you know, arrogance that I, I, that I, I would say you're a nice um, solution to. But on the other side, you get scientists that think of humanists and, uh, and people in the humanities and social sciences as people that have sort of have a fuzzy logic, don't really understand mm -hmm. the ecology, um, ecological concepts, mm -hmm. and don't use a scientific method. So even people like E.O. Wilson, who sure. writes Consilience, yes. who's asking us to bring it together, ultimately you can sort of see, you know, naturally where, that where he comes from, where kind of at the end of the book it all comes down to genes, right. yes, you know? <laughs> absolutely. We can bring it all together and it will mean biology. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And just to give one more quote, you know, from you, um, I seek to find a middle ground between the reductionist tendencies of what may be termed hard versions of both social constructivism and realism. Am I capturing something in your own understanding of sort of where, what you're trying to do in this book and succeeding, I think, yeah. and generally your own mindset towards these issues? You are. I'll point to two different things and then also talk a little bit about how my thinking has evolved as well. Yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind is the notion of generosity. Um, we jump as students mm. and as critics to critique instantly. It's mm -hmm. the first thing that comes to mind when you read something is, how is this wrong? How can I tear it apart? <laughs> and I encourage my students and I try to encourage myself as well to first keep in mind generosity, that for all of these writers I looked at and for anyone who is a creator of any kind, a maker, you're often starting with a blank page or some metaphorical version thereof and mm -hmm. to credit that act of creation and that act of making and to acknowledge that there are almost always um, strengths to that process, to that product mm -hmm. um, that deserves celebration before we then turn to the problems that accompany it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing is, uh, and I uh, use this both um, theoretically in the book, but also um, it's an important personal concept to me in terms of my understanding of the academy and what we're all doing here, and that is the metaphor of conversation. Yeah. That what happens on the page in our um, scholarship is really a version of what's happening right here. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation. It's mm -hmm. the, the conveyance mm -hmm. of ideas. Um, and so I think you know, my answer to Tim Morton's notions and the notions that many other people have articulated in the last five to ten years, I would say, um, is that it is a, an evolving conversation. And so mm -hmm. this, uh, just this past year, the um, Oxford Handbook of Eco-Criticism was published, and I have a chapter in there 
um, called Is American Nature Writing Dead? And it may surprise you that I say yes. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. And, uh, but I say its spirit lives on. <laughs> and so what I mean by that is that um, one of the things that I um, talk at length about in the book is the, um, uh, the importance of pragmatism and the importance of understanding when, um, uh, when something can have an effect in the world and mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is uh, very contingent. It's very dependent on um, the moment, on the audience, on all those things that uh, rhetoricians would have an interest in. Mm -hmm. And so it does strike me that both conceptually and in terms of that pragmatic component that the idea of nature has started to reach the end of its valuable life. Mm -hmm. um, and that really is uh, in keeping with the notion of the Anthropocene, which we now yeah. are very familiar with in the sense that we live in a world that is dominated by human influence. Mm -hmm. now, whether that began 12,000 years ago with the dawn of agriculture or 200 mm -hmm. years ago with the Industrial Revolution, is debatable, mm -hmm. um, but it's not debatable that where we are right now is um, uh, at a particular moment in history where that dominance is is very vivid to us. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it's equally dominant? No, it's very unevenly dominated. Mm -hmm. um, and it also doesn't mean that we are in control of everything, right. but it does mean that you can't go anywhere on the planet and not feel human influence, whether mm -hmm. you're in the deepest parts of the boundary waters where our effects on the climate will have an effect on that place, or the you know Times Square in, in, in New York City, um, mm -hmm. you you will have and feel and be aware of that human influence. Yeah. Um, and so, to talk about the idea of nature becomes much much more um, challenging mm -hmm. because, like the idea of God, it is a kind of transcendent notion, right? Yeah. That it will transcend human influence. And the argument of the Anthropocene is that we can't find that anymore. Mm -hmm. We can't find a place where, at least on Earth, we have not we can transcend human influence. Yeah. Yet at the same time, I find sometimes when I'm talking to scientists, they're not meaning it in that way. They're talking about nature yep. as meaning the material world right. as, as compared to symbolic constructions, representations thereof. Right. Yeah. And with Latour, et cetera, it seems like you're getting the sense that, that um, in the post postmodern, people are coming around back. Oh yeah, you know, there is the Latour, when a right? volcano goes like that, yeah. you know, it doesn't yeah. matter how you symbolically represent it; it'll right. still kill you. Yeah, you yeah. know. Um, so I, I I wonder in that sense because I don't think a scientist typically, like for example, the other day, and I won't name her. She's actually brilliant. Was saying, well, it seems like the one thing we can all ta uh, agree on is nature. And I was thinking, right. no. <laughs> <laughs> but what she meant is that yeah. there's something to study there right. that's beyond us. Right. You know? And that's why in the book, in that sentence that you, you quoted, um, I am very interested in the uh, connection and relationship between what we might call nature and what we might call culture, between the yeah. human and the natural and this mm -hmm. interpenetration of those at all times. So, you know, it's not that there isn't a, a uh, uh, aspects of the world that have a kind of objective reality out mm -hmm. there that, that I'm sure she is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it is to recognize the ways in which um, our actions are connected to all those things. And, mm -hmm. and the, it goes the other way as well, that mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that non-human world also has an effect on us. Yeah. And there is a tendency to, to um, uh, bifurcate uh, understandings of the Anthropocene, and there's a, uh, a discussion among conservation biologists about this very subject right now, which is, mm -hmm. you know, how are we supposed to understand this? Do Does it take us down a road toward a kind of eco-modernism? That's mm -hmm. one frame for our understanding of this period we're in, in which uh, we want to use technology to um, control the world even more, mm -hmm. or do we want to take it um, the other direction and say, no, this is the cause of the problem, and in fact, we need to return to some other kind of understanding yeah. of the wild that is non-humanly uh, yeah. powerful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and it seems like some of the discussions around the post-human are doing that, Similar too. things, yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question about the bounds of your study, how you focused it, and I think you, you made a good choice here, but the ultimate question is going to be, why America? Yeah. Um, you know, why the history of a nation state, for that matter, right. as a boundary for your study? Um, and I sense that you problematize that while wisely defining it in those terms. Um, for example, later on, you say history of the genre is primarily Western. Mm -hmm. And that is one place where it raised the question, if you're really focusing mainly on America, and for good reasons, as mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you'll explain, 
how would you know that it's primarily Western? I mean, I think of, for example, Laura Nader, when critiquing the critique of science, mm -hmm. says that there's this critique of science that says it's this Western thing. And she mm -hmm. says there's really, in the, in the way that science is generally described, there's no human culture that doesn't have science or a science at some level. Right. And that that itself can be a sort of orientalizing thing sure. to say that, oh, this is Western. It, it right. almost reappropriates something that's very human or nomothetic in some relations. Yeah. So I guess that's two questions. Why America? But then is nature writing the genre really mm -hmm. this thing that's Western? Mm -hmm. Or is it at some level at least something that, that people do generally? That's a great question. Um, and there's several components, I suppose, to answer it to an answer that would answer it correctly. Mm -hmm. So one is that when I say that this tradition is primarily Western, it's not to say that there are not ways in which other writers and other cultures engage the environment through mm. texts. Yeah. Um, but there are uh, very different culturally coded understandings of this thing we would call nature. In, mm -hmm. in some cultures, the idea of wilderness, which is particularly distinctively American, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. really wouldn't be present. You and can it, look at the UK and, and, yeah, and, and it, say it's very different. Right, and yeah. it, it certainly wasn't uh, a, a component of uh, Native American cultures either. Mm -hmm. So this was an idea that came with Europeans to mm -hmm. America um, and was developed further here as a result of settlers and colonialists' experience of the North American continent. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a piece to it which I think is um, is distinctively Western in that approach, in the, in the kind of emphases, in the kind of metaphors that people would use to understand the places in which they're at. But it's not to say that there isn't writing elsewhere. And in fact, there are many, many scholars now who are looking at um, global environmental literature, looking at the literature mm -hmm. of Asia, looking at the literature of Africa to try to understand how do these cultures, how do these writers come to terms with their environments. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that's one important component of it. The other important component is that um, it is a historical study yeah. in the sense of looking at the late 19th, early 20th century in the first part of the book and the mid to late 20th century in the second part. And so understanding the um, historicity of the project I was engaged in helps to explain why I focused on America, because yeah. those writers at the time were also focused on America. Yeah. Um, what happens actually- And they the, see themselves that they way. They see themselves yeah. that way, absolutely. They see themselves as American writers mm -hmm. um, and American citizens concerned about American nature. Mm -hmm. um, today, we would say, well, that's sort of reductive, isn't it? <laughs> uh, because what happens after Edward Abbey in particular dies uh, in 1989 is this dawning global consciousness, yeah. a, a dawning global environmental movement, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a much greater awareness of globalization, a much greater awareness of exactly what you're talking about, which is the, the non-Western roots of ideas and mm -hmm. the Western influence on non-Western places. We could turn the direction a little bit and also talk about the global south and mm -hmm. the global north and, and rephrase it that way. But no matter what, throughout the 90s, the early 21st century, the uh, important global implications of environmental issues and of writing um, would make for a different book. And in fact, that's the book that I'm working on right now. <laughs> oh, great, <laughs> wonderful, yeah. And I think part of that too is a more variegated sense of the non-Western, yeah. you know? So for example, Native North America, the Mexica a, would have a radically different absolutely. view of environment than yeah. say Ojibwe, et cetera. And, yeah. and, and, uh, so there's no singularity there, um, probably some of which might be very similar to what's called Western and some very yeah. different. Um, you know, I'm gonna, as I move along here and now into the specific cases, um, each of which I found extremely enlightening, especially um, being not in my area, a lot of it's just you know, informationally in terms of the narrative was fascinating. But a couple things then surprised me that I kind of, almost like you said, the, the, the sort of, well, we go to the critical, and not so much critical as in wanting you to sort of explain some things that, that I might not be understanding. One was I had never thought of Thoreau as a non-activist. And, and, and mm -hmm. here's why, because yeah. I came to it yeah. late, not yeah. as you as an expert, but I came to it very late. Um, I, I just wrote about Walden and Thoreau, 
has a parallel to explain when I mentioned YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, some uh, people that are using YouTube to do sort of their solo exploration in the wilderness, but clearly mm -hmm. with an, uh, a sense that somebody's looking over their shoulder and they yeah. want to mediate it to somebody. Right. So I very much presented, and I think maybe um, uh, uh, Jeff Todd Titan might be another person that would see mm -hmm. Thoreau as an activist. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Jeff's work. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned Thoreau's overt civil disobedience right. to the Mexican yeah. War yeah. and how he was willing to be, get arrested for that. I put all those things together that I'd always just almost assumed Thoreau's mm -hmm. an activist. Right. Yeah, and Walden's well, an activist text. Right. And so when I saw you not represented as activism, I, I almost wondered what you were meaning by that. Sure, yeah. And I, I mean it in really the most um, straightforward way, mm -hmm. and that this is not a guy who was manning the barricades. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, he is an activist in the sense that any text that has a reader has the potential for an activist, yeah. has the potential to, to act in the world, right? Um, mm -hmm. That has the potential to move that conversation in a particular direction and perhaps move, um, uh, you know, our, uh, the way we organize our society in a particular direction. So mm -hmm. in that sense, of course, Thoreau's an activist, but so are we all. Yeah. Um, so I so simply... It can become banal to say that right. it's activism Every text yeah. has a kind of activist component, but what yeah. he does not do is... Um, become uh, deeply engaged in the social movements of his time around some of these issues. And so to that degree, he is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, well, I'll say he's, he's not fully an armchair activist, but there is that aspect of it in which he um, is an activist through his words, but not an activist in, in terms of um, uh, the, uh, uh, any kind of uh, political movement. Yeah, and, de and the common definition of what yeah. we would call activism and something that has the potential to change policy, et cetera. Related to that, um, I was fascinated by your descrip description of Roosevelt, where really you're not sort of segregating out the act of writing. Mm -hmm. You're really representing it as imbricated in everything he does. I mean, yeah, traveling, hunting, hiking, and also writing. Yeah. And you emphasize your subjects representing their all evolving ideas in writing. Um, so, for example, I think you really do a nice job of bringing how Ro Roosevelt is in a certain class, gender, status, mm -hmm. ambitions, you know, yeah. race, etc. And he's playing those out through his writing. And you also seem to imply that they de develop their ideas, if you will, through writing. And that really was brought out for me in the Leopold case as well. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the question is, to what extent is writing the, the sort of key form here for mm -hmm. which you're, through which your subjects engage the world, and you clearly show how they're writing from an early age. Writing is yeah. clearly as central to all they do. Yeah. And to what extent is it just a part of their ecology of engagement? So you've right. got you know, Roosevelt, the hunter, mm -hmm. and he's writing about it. You know, um, where do you place writing in that as yeah. sort of uh, is it a place where people, you know, represent something or a place, mm -hmm. place where people are creating something? Yeah. Well, um, to answer the first or the second part of your question first, uh, you know, clearly writing is one thing among many that these individuals do and that all of us do if mm -hmm. we are engaged in the act of writing in one way or another. Um, so I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to say it is the one and only thing and it mediates everything else, mm -hmm. um, but it, is a, it has been a part of their work and in, in fact the, the tension between these um, writers writing and these writers activism, how directly they're connected or not connected is mm -hmm. one of the threads that I try to follow throughout the book. Um, in terms of what writing does, I think that you know, writing is a mode of personal expression Mm -hmm. um, but it is also a mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. We think by mm -hmm. writing. It's yeah. not the only way we think, but it's one of the best. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. one of the best ways because it forces us to be concrete. It forces mm -hmm. us to um, make visible the connections that might otherwise be somewhat vague in our own uh, just cognition of things. Or even mm -hmm. in, our, in our speech, we'll realize if we go back to the transcript of a conversation, mm -hmm. that when we go to put it on, uh, put it on paper, oh, I forgot this key component, right? Or, or I didn't make this connection clear. So the writing for these writers, I think, does that. It, it, it enables, and your gesture toward Leopold, I think, is crucial because he, through his writing, changes his ideas. He yeah. comes to see different things about his world and about uh, 
the non-human world as a result of putting it on paper. Mm -hmm. And he's probably never not writing. I mean, as right, I was looking absolutely. at Roosevelt, I'm, I'm yeah. just thinking about that. He's in the Dakotas, probably like Thoreau, yeah. knowing that I'm not just doing this, I'm narrating this for an audience. Right. And so he's almost in his head, you know, ri the writing is, is probably affecting what he does. Yeah. It also got me thinking as far as this, these students are all going to be um, creating a video in mm. a public um, land somewhere right. and doing right. an interpretive talk, kind of a ranger talk. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things we want to think through is how does that medium of video, audio, whatever kind of engagement right. also you know, yeah. affect how you learn about it. You and, know, exactly, and what I would encourage your students to do would be to see their work. It doesn't need to be writing. It could be the creation of a video. It could be the creation of a, a musical piece. It could be the creation of any kind of, or, or the, the making of any kind, the creation of any kind of product. There will be thought that will be expressed through that. And mm -hmm. the, the artistic choices you make about, um, about dialogue, about scenes, about images, about sound, all of those things will help you to think through how are these things connected or not. Mm -hmm. um, so it can happen in writing with the written word, but it can happen in any kind of creative, creative act as well. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, switching gears a little bit, and I don't want to keep you, you can tell I was way too fascinated by your book, and so I don't want to keep you too long, That's but um, You know, I, I think I'm going to skip that one and, and move to another one that, that we already touched on a little bit. At the very end, your very last line is basically um, how every piece of writing is also self-expression. You're mm -hmm. never just writing about something else. Right. And this is somewhat of a sidelight, but I found myself, you know, my trying, you know, for example, Roosevelt. Mm -hmm ideologically on the spectrum, very different from him. Absolutely. Yet I kept identifying with things he experienced yeah. and thought until when it came to the environment. Right. Um, as you were writing about these folks, who did you identify with? What oh, sort of things did question. you find? You know, yeah, yeah, I mean, as sort of as a person that's, that's bringing them to us. Yeah. Um, I, I, I suppose I would say that the person that uh, fascinated me the most, and it was the last chapter I wrote, was Leopold. Mm. Uh, now that's in part because he's a professor, I'm a professor, yeah. we share that interest. Um, but I also, I think the thing that I admire the most about him and, and I find um, the most intriguing and, and find him sort of as a model for is his ability to question himself and his mm -hmm. ability to change his mind. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the wonderful essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, uh, mm -hmm. in which he uh, goes to the... Uh, uh, American Southwest shoots a wolf, says he sees the green fire dying in its eyes, and has a revelation about um, the interaction between predators and uh, prey in the wild and what that means. And what made that essay distinctive for Leopold is that he's one of the, uh, uh, it's one of the few essays in which he documents his changing his mind and dramatizes that. It's the drama that's good for um, it's, it's, the, it's the approach that's good for all dramatic writing, mm -hmm. um, is to be confessional about it and then to show well, what are the implications of this change. And I, I find that really inspiring, and I think that that's true for most of us, that the, the most interesting things are when there's conflict or when there's change. And mm -hmm. so I think I admire him the most, I identify with him the most, um, in part because of that essay, because he's willing to say, you know what, I screwed up, and now I'm going to do this mm -hmm. as a result of that. Uh, and if only all of us could <laughs> be that, <laughs> you know, understanding, uh, have that much self-understanding, that much self-consciousness, yeah. that would be great. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, moving into Mabel Wright. Yeah. Um, uh, I was really struck reading that chapter um, with this parallel. And uh, you saw earlier I brought in the book, um, Denise Von Glan, who we had mm -hmm. visit in spring, um, the book is Music and the Skillful Listener, American Women Compose the Natural World. And just, you know, without flattening out, you know, all women at this time that are dealing yeah. with nature, but yeah. many of the composers from that period, similarly, um, Denise describes how they're, um, when she talks about skillful listening, mm -hmm. they're very much taking in the immediate and it's partly because they are ideologically, in other words, literally confined to the domestic space also, but also extremely aware of what you present as the garden and, yeah. the, and the domestic space and writing about that ecology in a way that in some ways presages how ecology is done now Absolutely. because it's so you know, um, intimate and detailed. Mm -hmm. 
and women composers were doing many of the same things that Mabel Wright was doing with her nature writing. There wasn't so much a question there, so much as I just think yeah. that, that oh, there's, no. there's, there's, there's a lot to be studied there. And in yeah. fact, the question would be then more writ large. Um, and in fact, this is one of the two places where I'll where uh, we'll kind of uh, get the milk without paying for the cow. If I could have you read a paragraph sure, that I think yeah. you do a wonderful job of describing sort of exclusions and, and marginalized voices. And the larger question would be, and you partly answer it by reading mm -hmm. this, but you know, what, what is the place of sort of, 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 I don't want to say forgotten voices, but mm -hmm. so much those yeah. that are unacknowledged yeah. often. Um, this is page 104 to 105, the ending of that chapter. I think you just do a sure. really nice job of, of, sure. of summarizing the idea. By the standards of John Muir and the Sierra Club, whose fight against the Hetch Hetchy Dam in Yosemite National Park was lost before Birdcraft Sanctuary, Mabel Wright's uh, uh, founding sanctuary, was even founded. The achievement of Mabel Osgood Wright and the Connecticut Audubon Society may seem like little more than a footnote to the grand narrative of conservation history. It would be a mistake, though, to overlook the significance of Wright's accomplishments, central as they were to the popularization of environmental concern, just as it would be a mistake to overlook the role local conservation efforts have played in the formation of national organizations. Part of a nexus of environmental reformers working in the decades surrounding the turn of the century, Wright was especially successful at crafting rhetorical appeals to women that relied less on the frontier-based conservation of the Dakota cowboy and more on the garden-based conservation of the suburban homemaker. In the end, Wright actually began to sound more like John Muir, who argued for wilderness as an antidote to civilization than she did Theodore Roosevelt, who had been her childhood dance partner. <laughs> as she argued in a 1902 article in the journal Bird Lore, quote, the protection of what is elevating and wholesomely beautiful is one of the most crying human needs of today. What is left for humanity when there is no convenient retreat from where indoors and city and self are fettered together. In today's push and scramble, humanity must everywhere have refuge where heart of man may realize that however much he may have changed, the fowls of the air and the flowers of the field are as of old, and that heart of nature still lives and is working out the plan made him by heart of God. So she uses very Victorian language there in this phrasing of the heart of man, heart of nature, and heart of God. Um, but I get your point, and I think that she is a great example of uh, a forgotten voice in American mm -hmm. conservation history. Um, and one of the things that we gain from paying attention to those forgotten voices are different ways of seeing the world. And in fact, I think I'll make a connection here between what she was talking about at the turn of the century, early decades of the 20th century, seeing the importance of the garden as a metaphor. So it, mm -hmm. was, it was more than a metaphor for her in that she created a garden, she was herself a gardener, she had one of the most um, uh, well-known and well-tended gardens in Fairfield, Connecticut. It was a very domestic space, it was a very suburban space, very mm -hmm. far from the grand uh, landscapes of Yosemite National Park, for instance. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, even even given that, um, it was it was a powerful metaphor then, but it wasn't seen as such. Now we have people like Michael Pollan writing mm -hmm. in his book Second Nature that we should see the world as a garden. Mm -hmm. He where is he? He is in Connecticut. He creates a garden in his backyard, and he realizes, oh, gardening is a, is a powerful way to see the natural world. And most mm -hmm. recently, we have uh, the writer Emma Maris, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called um, uh, uh, Rambunctious Garden which is all about understanding the world uh, in the Anthropocene as a garden, that mm -hmm. this is a space that now we humans have to somehow manage to control in a sort of lowercase c control. Yeah. We, ha we have to shape this. We can't not shape this world anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so paying attention to the forgotten voice of Mabel Wright illuminates the ways in which it, it's not pollen who originated this metaphor right and it's mm -hmm. not and it's not mm -hmm. right either frankly it goes back much further than her but each of these people played a critical role in developing this understanding of the relationship that humans have in the non-human world absolutely thank you very much and in fact one of the things that you're discussing is fits right into the next question and moving on to uh, leopold for example actually to muir sorry sure 
Muir, um, you, you mentioned the hard work of making a farm on page 113. Yeah. And for me, that resonated. There's another book, book I brought along that, that made me think of this same issue. It's yeah. called The Jukebox in the Garden, and mm -hmm. it's about eco-criticism and American pop and music since 1960. And one of the characters that sticks out of being very different from the late 60s, early 70s turned to environmentalism and rock and folk and a sort of folk rock, you yeah. know, suddenly yeah. you got this fluorescence that was very romanticized and literally rock musicians mm -hmm. are moving out to the countryside, et cetera. Right. One of the exceptions was Dylan. Oh, yeah. Dylan, who grew up in a harsh climate Absolutely. and at had at least some exposure to a non-recreational experience yeah. of the yeah. outdoors, yeah. doesn't necessarily romanticize right. you know, environment in the same way and yeah. instead deals with it in, in some ways. It's, it's more anthropomorphized, mm -hmm. but it's something that's not necessarily this, this wonderful, great, balanced uh, world. Right. In each of your descriptions, I could see the relationship between you know, how they're enculturated, how one was raised in relationship to the outdoors, if you will, yeah. and what they experience as adults and write about. Um, do you think there's something there as far as the way in which we then write about nature and experience it um, as far as how we've experienced it as a Absolutely. child? Absolutely. And it's critical, in fact. I think that, um, you know, many people have observed that between the ages of uh, 7 and 12, that this is sort of the magical moment in which a lot of our understandings of the non-human world are shaped or unfortunately in too many cases not shaped because mm. there is no exposure to a non-humanly uh, created space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's part of the uh, movement that we see in terms of uh, uh, a no child uh, left inside, the idea that we're going to try to get kids out uh, of, mm -hmm. of that age in particular out into um, uh, some space that has less human influence over it. Now that's not, I'm hesitating there at saying the word nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but to get them out into some sort of non-humanly dominated space. And, and it's also the reason that paying attention to individual experience matters. Mm -hmm. That while, again, our, 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 uh, the wisdom and knowledge that um, colleagues who do work in anthropology, in mm -hmm. uh, sociology, can bring to us about these larger systems is vital and crucial. Uh, but it is also really important to see the way an individual life unfolds yeah. and to understand how what someone does at 40, at 50, at 60 is intimately connected to their understandings as a child. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, which leads to some nicely practical, when you mentioned pragmatics, um, communication issues. For example, on page 148, um, Muir sort of uh, is, is saddened by the fact that people don't, aren't aware of what national parks already exist at that time mm -hmm. and what's happened and he, he sort of sees a lack of communication there, sure. if you will, about uh, an information. I often find that the case, the Mississippi River Gorge right here, yeah. very few people know it's part of the National Park Service, right. that there's rangers attached yeah. to it. Yeah. And I think there's probably all kinds of reasons beyond you know what we can mm -hmm. talk about here but do you still see that as a problem sort of lack of knowledge about say the public lands and what is uh, in the commons as far as yeah. the, some of these questions are, are concerned yeah uh that's a tough question and mm -hmm. it's a question i'm not sure i know the answer to because i'm not sure any of us know the answer to mm -hmm. um, the media landscape has changed so dramatically since the time Muir was writing even mm -hmm. in the last 10 years as we know uh that on the one hand, there is enormous amount of uh, uh, greater information that's available mm -hmm. because of the internet, um, and we can have access to much greater knowledge than we ever could. Mm -hmm. Whether we access it and whether we have the means to place it into an organizational scheme that will allow us to understand it is another question. Mm -hmm. And so, on the one hand, there's a lot more information out there, so people, some people do know more than mm -hmm. they would have during Muir's time about those sorts of issues 
like where the national parks are and, and, and what kind of ecologies they are part of. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, it may be the case that there's so much information out there that there's even less knowledge about that. Yeah. And not having done a survey or a study of it, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. Or just um, this general sense that, gee, we must know all of this because it's out there now. Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and as a result, I don't personally need to know it because <laughs> yeah. the hive mind of Wikipedia knows it. So, um, you know, I think that, that uh, that's the place actually where somebody unlike myself, someone who does surveys, who mm -hmm. does uh, these larger kind of social science uh, mm -hmm. and interpretive social science uh, studies could make a great contribution. Yeah, and it's something I'm hoping students will explore and I think are exploring by virtue of the assignment where they're doing this interpretive talk in a public land space because my sense is that there's a dominant discourse about public lands um, literally, for example, on a search engine, you're mm -hmm. kind of guided to something that per market logic will right. sell something. So somebody yeah. is wanting to, you know, have you stay there because it's a, a budding of public land. Right. So an interest that ultimately can undo itself in terms of wanting more development to be able right. to make more money off of that. And then a constraint on the part of public officials such as rangers mm -hmm. to be able to say anything that would be looked at as tendentious mm -hmm. about a public land. So having to sort of be careful about what they, right. how they present them, promote them, right. et cetera, yeah. which I think there's sort of this area then for, if you will, public media that yeah. isn't always fulfilled and, and you really pointed yeah. out well. I w and I would just add to that, I think that that term public is just critical. Yeah. It's critical in understanding the metaphor of the park that John Muir was mm -hmm. focused on and, and, and helped to uh, uh, promote in North America. I think it's critical to understanding the importance of a public university. And yeah. I think it's intimately connected to the idea of the commons, mm -hmm. a much greater idea for 21st century environmental concerns. And so I think it's terrific if students are engaged in a some kind of public land, some kind of public space, and asking questions about what is the public? Mm -hmm. um, what uh, role does uh, the public sphere play, not just in terms of a, a space of debate, but a space that might possibly be outside of the marketplace? And yeah. so your observation that there are these gateway communities often right next to national yeah. parks, where it is about commerce and it is about sales of some kind, mm -hmm. of income generation of some kind, and then a space that is a public space mm -hmm. that is outside that market-based mentality. That's mm -hmm. a really important moment of, of, um, of connection and of, of contrast, too, between mm -hmm. those two different um, ways of seeing. Yeah, excellent. Um, and when I was picturing you, when you're talking about that gateway, I was picturing, for example, I was just in Yellowstone, where there's, mm -hmm. there's each one has a gateway. Yes, a literal gateway community. Yeah. yeah, and so much of what we see here, uh, like on page 179, Leopold, I'm from Iowa, mm -hmm. and my grandfather used to always, you know, go west, young man. He would literally recite that poem because when he was young, right. that's how you learn by reciting poetry, and that was such a common trope. Mm -hmm. Leopold really develops a lot of his ideas by going to the desert southwest. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt develops his ideas by going to the west. The west seems so, you know, uh, who, it was for Leopold, the, the westward I go free section. Yeah. Um, what is that about? I mean, even when you get something like the Heads, Hudson River Valley, where you have all these fundamental environmentalists in the pastoral movement, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, Pete Seeger, yeah. every, you know, on, on, on up to, you know, through, so across many, many decades often end up out west, mm -hmm. often end up describing the west, often the, the, the policy plays out around the west. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's tied to so many things. I mean, it's t uh, I think a, a critical aspect of uh, any person's um, affection for a place is, is the specific components of that particular place. Mm -hmm. And for uh, you know, we talked earlier about the idea that nature writing is a largely Western phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, and what goes along with that is the fact that it brings with it Western kinds of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, we see people taking the idea of the picturesque and of the sublime and, and applying them to North American landscapes. So mm -hmm. some of the appeal of the West is the result of these aesthetic notions being applied to this new landscape and seeing that as a good, whereas you might not see uh, the prairie landscape 
as a as equally impressive mm -hmm. because it has a very different aesthetic to it. I mean, mm -hmm. It doesn't have what what I call, uh, in terms of John Muir, a kind of he has a kind of vertical morality, in which the higher you go, right, <laughs> the 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 better you are, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, he. He wouldn't have. He wouldn't know what to do really with a, a, a sort of a Great Plains kind of landscape. It doesn't fit mm -hmm. his aesthetic preference, and so I think part of the appeal of the West is that certainly for a lot of these writers, part of the appeal of the West was um, a lack of other people. Um, there has always been mm -hmm. this sort of um, uh, aspect to uh, American nature writing that. Um, uh, really is how far away can I get from other people and how uh, surrounded by uh, non-human space can I find myself in. And that's very much a part of the wilderness impulse in, in, mm -hmm. in all of North America. So there's some of that happening in the West. Um, you know, there are, um, uh, the, what accompanies that is this issue of the individual and all of these individuals, although they were involved in the creation of these organizations, none of them with the possible exception of Mabel Wright, were really mm -hmm. kind of organization men or organization mm -hmm. women. Yeah. Um, they they, mm -hmm. they were uh, connected to people who shared their values, but um, they saw themselves in part as, as individuals. Mm -hmm. and, the, and so the West, where there are fewer people, allows one's individualism to flourish. Yeah. Um, so it's a combination of physical spaces and mm -hmm. then also mental ideas, uh, 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 aesthetic ideas, uh, uh, ideological preferences that, that come together in that particular geographic location. That makes sense. In fact, I agree with all of it, but I think we found the one place where we might have a disagreement as far as where our constructivism and, and uh, essentialism start, and that yeah. is being from Iowa, I can't imagine anybody visiting that and then visiting um, the Sierras and saying, that's just an aesthetic pre <laughs> preference. I just think there's a little bit of a universal there, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe in terms of, of human right. preferences for landscape, right. but I, we can leave that to right. the side. You may, they may, <laughs> what person has visited Yosemite and not said, wow. Right, exactly. There's Whereas some, what person has visited the, any place in the Midwest and said, wow. Uh, I don't know, I still think though, that's a culturally coded yeah, response I, to landscape. You know, I, I, so. I do think that there's this incredible beauty everywhere, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but there's something about there some something spaces about with that. topography where, yeah. where almost anybody kind yeah. of is, is awed by it in some right. way. Um, but I'm just teasing, no. of course, you know. Two questions left, and sure. you, you've been extremely kind here with your time. No, no. Um, one is you mentioned Leopold and the University of Wisconsin, and it really got me thinking, what role have universities played? Yeah. Either you can you know, talk about universities in terms of these larger questions we're asking about the public right. and our senses of nature, but if you prefer even, in the production of nature writing. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of the UK situation, I taught a course there where we dealt with a couple pieces of nature writing there where it really almost always seemed there was some connection to at least public education. Yeah. Um, what roles have you, uh, public universities played in this? Yeah. Well, Leopold was the first professor of wildlife management and, mm -hmm. and for a long time the only professor of wildlife management, uh, the chair of his own department uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, Edward Abbey eventually um, taught at uh, the University of Arizona. Um, so, and there are certainly now in MFA programs all around the country uh, people who do writing in relationship to mm -hmm. the non-human world. Um, so I think universities, um, particularly in terms of creative writing, have had an important role in fostering and furthering uh, writing about uh, the environment. You know, they also, though, serve to um, move ideas forward, move ideas mm -hmm. in different directions. And so the fact that Madison um, developed this program changed the way we see Yes. what wildlife management is. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that universities like our own are focused increasingly on interdisciplinary conversations, on bringing scientists and social scientists and humanists together in one space to both understand a problem and then try to solve it, I think is an important step forward yeah. in seeing that universities actually have an, in, an, an increasingly important role in shaping public understanding, but also our, our own academic understanding of these problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to jump to the last question as far as, in all of these cases, writing has been so essential. And I would argue it still is, and I'd be fascinated to hear about the death of, na of nature yeah. writing in that regard. But one thing that does 
come to mind for me is the question of medium. As I said, mm -hmm. students are exploring with other media as far as they're dealing with it, and writing, you know. Right. Um, in fact, writing still is central to almost all those media. But um, the question would be, if you were to extend the book onward and think of commensurate cases, and they were not leaping to mind for me. I'm yeah. thinking, is there Al Gore and, yeah. you know, yeah. um, uh, un Inconvenient Truth? But um, what would be some of the commensurate cases, um, Obama recently on a glacier, what are the uh, commensurate cases that would deal with other media and perhaps similar right. figures? Yeah. Uh, well, and the media environment has changed greatly since mm -hmm. uh, I end the book right around 1990. Um, and I think that it is the case that writing is it's certainly not the, uh, playing the same role it was when, when John Muir could write articles in the Century magazine mm -hmm. and have an effect on, on uh, policymakers in Washington almost directly yeah. in terms of protecting landscapes in, the, in, uh, in California. And so I think, you know, an example today might be uh, Betsy Colbert, Elizabeth Colbert, mm -hmm. who, um, like Rachel Carson, first published uh, Silent Spring in uh, the early 1960s in The New Yorker. It was a serialized three-part uh, uh, appearance in The New Yorker. Betsy Colbert's Field Notes from a Catastrophe started mm -hmm. out as a serial, serialized uh, uh, mm -hmm. a piece of uh, long-form journalism in The New Yorker also. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, that book has gone on to influence policymakers, our, our larger cultural understanding of climate change, and her most recent book, The Sixth Extinction, which also started out as a series in The New Yorker, um, just won the Pulitzer Prize. So she oh, is a that. great example of someone who I think carries on this kind of tradition. She's not writing in quite the same way in that she isn't as interested in um, the form of the nonfiction essay so much as being a journalist. Yeah. Um, and that's not, a, that's not the better or worse in any way. She's a marvelous writer and she has a great ability to make um, difficult and complicated scientific um, concepts um, understandable to a general readership. And mm -hmm. um, so whether she's talking about climate change or climate change and its effect on biodiversity with this current book, she is a good example of somebody who continues to influence through language. But that said, um, we see that uh, you know, people's influence is also added on to through media, through yeah. her television interviews, through her appearances in person and book tours, um, through uh, films that appear about climate change, about biodiversity loss, and so on. So I think the written word is part of now a much larger, much more complicated, much more dynamic and fluid ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we need to pay attention to those changes in the media landscape if mm -hmm. we're going to understand the continuing power of words in our world. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, um, thank you. I, you mentioned that you have a new project regarding food and place. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us just a little bit about sure. that? I imagine students are interested. Yeah. In so this is an extension uh, in some sense of conserving words, but it's also a, a new direction for me um, in that uh, I think that the two most powerful changes in environmentalism since 1990 are the connected to the transformation of environmentalism to sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so it's just as it's very, very difficult for us to separate out the human from the natural anymore, um, it's difficult to just talk about environmentalism without talking about social justice issues, uh, without talking about economic mm -hmm. uh, uh, transactions. And so the two issues that, that fit that sustainability um, frame are climate change on the one hand, and I think food on the other. I think mm -hmm. food is the way through which um, so many individuals today experience the non-human world and experience how we have transformed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also have the ability to shape that transformation or resist mm -hmm. that transformation mm -hmm. in particular ways. So this in this new project, um, I similarly look at three different, uh, take three different approaches or three different lenses. Uh, I'm interested in the um, transformation of food through agriculture, and particularly community-supported agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading the works of Wendell Berry through the lens of a community-supported agriculture farm in Wisconsin. Mm. Um, so I'm reading each of these writers in place. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also, in the second chapter, looking at the work of Carlo Petrini, the founder of the Slow Food Movement, mm -hmm. uh, and reading his work through the um, northern Italian Piedmont landscape, where he was born and where slow food mm -hmm. was created and 
and which has its own really rich culinary history. And I'm reading mm -hmm. it not just through that landscape, but through a whole range of artists and food producers that I met and interviewed while I was there. Uh, and then a final chapter um, wh where I'm reading the, um, uh, the recipes as well as uh, writings and, and the media of Julia Child mm -hmm. and Alice Waters, the California chef, both of whom um, had uh, uh, core foundational experiences in France. And so I'm reading them through uh, the uh, specific space of Lyon, France, the gastronomic mm -hmm. capital of France, where um, I was last year and interviewed a range of women, uh, expat, American expats, who were involved in the food industry in Lyon. And so there I'm interested in um, not simply food's uh, 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 transformation through artisan production, but food's transformation in the kitchen and the role that chefs play in the sustainable food movement. So still interested in how particular writers have shaped a movement, but not simply the environmental movement, but the sustainable food movement. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I can't wait you. for those publications. And you've been extremely generous with your time. I you just uh, I really appreciate that. And Glad on behalf of the students, thank Glad you. Glad to help. So, all right.